And we're off. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is Joe Dumont from Sidemoon.com, and welcome to our COVID-19 Shabbat service. <laughs> That's so weird to say that. I'm going to, should I keep that? I'm down here in the Dominican Republic right now, <laughs> having a blast. No, I'm here in isolation like all the rest of you. Uh, we have another guest speaker today. We have a number of guest speakers, and just to remind everybody what we're doing, we are allowing people to share their teaching so that it's not always on my back to do so. And uh, we can, um, oh, now I just did something else there. But this way everyone gets a chance to teach and then we have an audience that can listen and ask questions and discuss things. So this way other people are learning to teach as well. And today we have a gentleman all the way from, and I think I got it right, Uruguay. And his name is Lewis. Where are you, Lewis? You're, are you ready to go, Lewis? Hey, yes, I am. Let me just okay. share well, my just, screen if that's okay. Yeah, well, just hang on a second. We're gonna start this off. We're gonna ask for an opening prayer. Before I do, well, no, let me do the opening prayer because then I, I will forget. Our Father, our Father Yehovah, our powerful and great creator, we thank you, Father. We thank you for your Shabbat. We thank you, Father, for your holy days and for teaching us what they mean. And we thank you, Father, for your sabbatical jubilee, your revelations that you've shown us. We ask your blessing, Father, upon this day, upon this teaching, and upon all that goes on here today, that you bless us, help us to learn, help us to grow, help us to come to know you better, to grow closer to you. And we pray, Father, that you would take the veil away from more people so that more people can learn these truths and be blessed by this understanding about you. So we ask your blessing upon today, upon the speaker, upon the, upon the technology that we're reaching all the way around the world. And we ask that you be with us and guide us and all for the glory of your name. In the name of Jehovah, I pray. Amen. So I just want to say I have an email from um, Rachel, and Rachel just sent me and told me that the uh, three prisoners who were hit by the tornado had been moved. We still haven't made contact with them. Um, Michael, Keith, and Jimmy have all been transferred to Pennsylvania, and uh, they're all good and safe. They are in isolation uh, for their quarantine for the next 14 days because of the coronavirus. So that's the latest update I have in them. And I posted that in the newsletter this week. Um, now Rachel sort of looks after the, the emails coming to and from them so that I, because there's a little process you have to go through so that I don't ignore them or forget about them. And so she helps me there in that part of the, what we're doing here. So Lewis, Tell us about you, where you are, how long you've been in this walk, and uh, oh, look, <laughs> I just see what Simon did. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, uh, everyone's having fun here. Okay. Anyway, Lewis, the floor is yours. If you want to take over and start the, your show, you can uh, your slideshow. You can go ahead, and I'll mute myself. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Make sure that works. Uh, before we get started. There you go. It's all yours. Uh, okay, so are you seeing, what are you seeing? Biblical sure. prayer and it uh, looks like Solomon down in front of the temple. All right, great. Perfect. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Lewis. I was born and raised in New York and was called down to Uruguay about seven years or so ago, oh, 2013. Um, not really sure why, just kind of followed uh, um, what I, the message I was getting. And um, so I'm here, very happy, and have been say, walking in Torah for maybe four or five years or so, um, keeping the feasts for about three or four, and just constantly learning and reading and, and uh, trying to figure this all out like everybody else. 
Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, the Joseph for allowing um, us all to gather together on these calls each week. Um, Brother Randy for going through my presentation and making sure I wasn't way off base. Um, for Joe for approving me. So thank you very much for that. Um, I really enjoyed the last few weeks, uh, maybe three or four weeks gathering here with everybody. Um, seems like a very beautiful group of people. Um, so I hope today's message on uh, biblical prayer that I have um, will reach everyone and give you a bit more clarity as to what the Bible itself says about prayer. So I want to discuss um, these six things, the five W's, who, what, where, why, and when, along with how, and how to pray is going to be the largest section. And it seems like the Bible has the most to say about that, so I'll, I'll spend the most time on that in the presentation. Okay, so first, I, I'm pretty sure we all realize not every prayer is answered. Um, many reasons for that. We may not be asking for the right thing, or even if we are, it may hurt us or someone else if it's given to us. Um, so if it doesn't allow with, align with his will or is going to do someone harm, usually those are withheld from us. Um, but in addition to that, there are conditions to prayer. So it's important to realize that even if you're asking for the right thing, your prayer might not be heard if you're not in the right mindset or in the right heart set. Yeah, so Proverbs 28.9 says, He that turneth his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. It doesn't seem like it matters what your prayer is in that situation if you're not obeying he's not going to he's not going to give you an audience proverbs 15 8 the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to jehovah but the prayer of the upright and that word means righteous or pleasing to god so the prayer of the upright is his delight and then chronicles 2 7 14 gives us a bit more clarity on exactly what some of these conditions are he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We have a couple things that he's putting contingent. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. So then I will hear implies if we don't do those things beforehand, that he will not hear or he may not hear. So I'm going to put this link in the chat. Um, Oops, excuse me. I'm going to put this link in the chat. Um, I guess I'll do it after the presentation. So when I was doing the research for this, just Googling, so just Googling things here and there, um, I came across this site which has six articles, a six-part series with literally hundreds of passages. He goes into the Hebrew and the Greek if, if it applies. And they're really well done. Um, but as a disclaimer, I don't know this person. And I don't endorse any of their other beliefs that they may or may not have. I just found these particular articles rather well done. So um, I will put that in the chat at the end so that you can copy that uh, into a browser, bookmark it, and, and go through it at your own leisure. Okay. So the first thing I want to discuss is who to pray to. And as I read the scriptures, we are to pray to the Father, Yehovah, and Him alone. Um, some people might have other thoughts on that. I'm, I would expect a few questions on that at the end of the slideshow. But that's how I read it anyway. We are to pray to the Father. So if we look, what does our Messiah say? It's Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So, and not on the screen, of course, is the Lord's Prayer, Jehovah's Prayer, which he begins with our Father who art in heaven. So he's directing it specifically to the Father. Um, a few more witnesses from Peter, if you call on the Father, for the eyes of Jehovah are over the righteous, and his ears, his ears are open unto their prayers. And John tells us that Yeshua is our advocate to the Father. He says, My little children, if these things I write unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua HaMashiach, the righteous. And John in Revelation also says, or Yeshua through John says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. 
so I made also a list of who we are not to pray to. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list. Just a couple things that came to my mind. You know, you can read it there. Gaia, rock and stone, the earth, the heavens, rivers, trees, sun, moon, and stars. Any other gods, idols, which would include, in my opinion, crosses, beads, a picture of Jesus or Yeshua or an image at all, any kind of image or statue. Angels, you know, saints, popes, ancestors, fathers, deceased ones and Mary. I find that those are the most often things prayed to that we should not be. Um, again, I said, about, I'm of the opinion we should only be praying to Jehovah and no one else. So next we have why to pray. And this is a very long topic. I don't really think anyone here needs to know why to pray. Um, there are many reasons, and we all have a desire, and I'm pretty sure we all have prayed in the past. So I don't want to take up too much of our time. It's just going to be one slide. So just focus on one reason why to pray, and that's simply because it works. Um, our prayers, as we saw before, if we meet the conditions of being humble and obedient, and we ask for something that accords with his will, we shall receive it. As Mark 11:24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what so things... So ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall receive them. Matthew 21, 22, all, and all things whatsoever ye shall, ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Um, and this is kind of the, the bit that gets me every time, that he actually hears our prayers in real time. And as, as, we, saw, as we see in Daniel, before the words are even finished leaving our lips, um, the answer is already being sent. Because he knows all things and he knows what we're going to ask before we even ask for it. But the act of doing so and coming into his presence, as we'll discuss it a little later on, is, is very important. Um, and just finally, one last witness from James says, this is about healing, but he says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And again, we get the, the condition of being righteous, as we saw before from that... Um, that's Second Chronicles verse. So again, just one slide on that. Um, and now we get into the largest section. So from the shortest to the largest um, is how to pray. And from what I've seen in the brethren and myself until only a few months ago, very recently, is that prayer involves as much as what we're saying and how we're saying it and why we're saying it as to physically how we are saying it, our posture and our appearance. Um, which I think is overlooked by most of the brethren. So from that website I mentioned earlier, um, in his count, which I didn't, I didn't verify this, but he had this on the site, so um, I'll just put it here. He had, when someone prayed and it mentioned, and the Bible mentioned the position of that person while they were praying, with their hands lifted up, it was 147, lying prostrate, prostate, <laughs> or with their face to the ground was 131, kneeling was 27. This was a list of maybe 10 or so positions. I just chose the top three, because after this, it gets to like four, five, three, two, like it's very uh, small numbers, but these were the, the largest by far. Um, so again, due to the amount of time and the amount of times it's mentioned by the father, um, excuse me, I'm gonna try to get the dogs to <laughs> stop barking if that's possible. Sorry about that. Um, so due to the amount of time that he spends on it in his word, I'm going to spend a good amount of time on it here. And as a disclaimer, I just want to say that I'm not saying that if you stand at attention with your hands behind your back, looking up to heaven, that he's not going to hear you. It's completely up to him what prayers that he hears. But what I'm saying is that I'm seeing a pattern and a prescribed way that he wants to be worshipped. And since he's showing it to us, I think it's our duty to, to see that and to obey him. Um, yes, yeah, so next slide here. Um, Exodus 9.29, and Moses said unto him, this is unto Pharaoh, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto Jehovah, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall be any hail, that thou mayest know that the earth is Jehovah's. And so Leviticus 9.22, we see Aaron 
lifting up his hands toward the people and blessing them. And then in Deuteronomy 32, 40, it says, For I, this is Jehovah speaking, for I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. And then in Luke 24, 50, the Messiah speaks and says, or sorry, it says, and he, the Messiah, led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. So we see there is power in being lifted up. So this is describing the battle when Amalek came against the people during their wanderings in the wilderness. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stand, stayed up his hands, one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So there's a whole lot of symbolism in these two verses, and, and entire sermons have been, um, you know, made about Joshua leading the battle, the rock that he sits upon, you know, Moses symbolizing the Torah, obviously, Yeshua the rock, Aaron of the tribe of Levi, Hur of the tribe of, jo of Judah, standing on either side of the law and, and upholding it with steady hands, and just the image of what he looks like, he would look like the cross with both hands out to the sides both arms, I suppose, out to the sides. So um, I'm going to call your attention here um, to the word used for hands. We see it as Yad, H3027. So it says, Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Psalm 134, 2, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless Jehovah. And in Psalm 28, 2, hear the voice of my supplication. And when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. So the reason I'm calling your attention to the word yad, or hands, is a derivative of that word is yada, or yada. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm pretty sure that's close. Um, so we can see this is, it's an implication of the hand. It's a denominative of H3027, which we just looked at, which literally means to use or hold out the hand especially to revere or worship with extended hands, to profess, to confess, but perhaps properly to show or point out with the hand extended. So it's very, it comes from the word meaning hand, and it literally means hand, but if you look how it's translated into English, not a single one of those words has anything to do with a hand. So when I hear praise, give thanks, confess, I think of verbal. But to me, it means mouth. I'm confessing with my mouth. But a literal interpretation of what this means is you're confessing, you're praising with your hands. So in the Hebrew mindset, um, all of those uses in English really have a, a physical implication rather than just the verbal. So I just took two examples of one is praise and, and um, one is give thanks that we saw, same word. So it says, thanks unto Jehovah, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. But he could easily just substitute the literal meaning and raise your hands unto Jehovah. And then if we look at Genesis 29, 35, and Leah conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now I will praise Jehovah. Therefore, she called his name Judah or Yehuda, and left bearing. But again, the literal use of the word praise, it says, now will I extend my hands to Jehovah. And therefore, she called his name Yehuda. And you can see there's Yehuda. The word is derived from, <laughs> from these the same words. So it goes Yad, Yada, Yahu, Da. It's the same thing. It's just, well, not the same, obviously, but it's, it's a progression built upon Yad, the base word. So Judah, Yehuda means praise, essentially. And that, as we see, has to do with the hand. And it should be no surprise, um, as we see the heave and the wave offerings, this is used throughout, um, excuse me, this is used throughout the scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, you know, lifting up to heaven, as I mentioned, <clears throat> has power. So the priests, for the sacrifices and for the wave offerings to be accepted, they would ha literally have to raise them with their arms up to heaven. So it would make sense in this time without a temple that the offerings which our prayers should be raised up as well or lifted up as well. 
So we've discussed the hands and the arms part of the posture. Now the recon to the rest of the body. Um, what we're literally doing when we pray is entering the throne room. Our petition is being heard before the king. So we are entering his presence, and as such, our, our physical appearance should reflect that. You know, um, I, I doubt any earthly king or ruler would, would stand for someone approaching them arrogantly, you know, walking in with the swagger and demanding their request be honored and then strutting out, you know, with, without any really regard for the office of the king. So I, I doubt that our heavenly king would find the same behavior acceptable. And throughout all his word, we can see that he, he really doesn't. <laughs> Um, which I hope to show. So we go to Matthew 26, 39, and he is talking about Yeshua, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it, is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou wilt. In Revelation 7, 11, the angels which stood around the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, they all fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped Elohim, worshiped God. And the four and twenty elders which sat before the before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. So this is a behavior that is happening in heaven when we when they enter his presence. Um, so again, I don't think that we should be any different. Now we look at earthly examples. Joshua 7, 6. Uh, Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of Jehovah until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust upon their heads. And when all the people saw it, and this is in the King's passage, is talking about Elijah bringing fire down from heaven. When they saw that, they fell on their faces and said, Yehovah, he is God. Yehovah, he is the God. In Ezekiel 44, 4, again, this was in a vision, um, but we see the same behavior. Then he brought me, the angel, to the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of Yehovah filled the house of Yehovah, and I fell upon my face. So I tend to believe that they're describing, rather than lying down flat, I think they're describing this position. You know, they fell to the ground on their knees with their face bowed to the ground. I could be wrong, it could be lying down flat, but I tend to believe that it's this position um, because as we will see, kneeling is a very integral part. Um, so again, back to the Second Chronicles verse that we looked at earlier. As if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So what does that mean to humble oneself? If we look at the word, it properly means to bend the knee, to bring down into subjection, to be under, to humble or subdue. It says to bow the knee, to fall on one's knees. You know, to, it, it could mean the hollow of the knee itself or to bow down. So he's saying, if my people, which are called by my name, shall bow themselves or shall kneel, onto me and pray and do all these other things, then I will hear. So again, humbling is a physical activity as well as a mindset and a heart set, but there is a physical component, component to it. So another word that we see often is worship. In Genesis 24, 52, and it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped Yehovah. Um, I'm not going to say that, sh Shadak, I'm not sure, bowing himself to the earth. Or shaka, I suppose, um, a primitive root to depress, to prostrate, especially reflexive in homage or royalty or God, to bow down, to crouch, to fall flat, to humbly beseech, to make obeisance, to reverence, to make, to stoop, to worship. And we just saw that worship is bending the knee. Um, so, or humble, I should say, to, to bend the knee. So, um, praising, confessing, being humble, worshiping, these are all physical actions in the Hebrew mindset. And we can see it again in these next two verses, worship is coupled with a physical activity. So from Exodus, you know, the people believed, and when they heard that Yehovah had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads, and literal meaning, they bowed their heads, and they kneeled, or they crouched down, or they paid homage, and they worshiped. Same same thing, essentially. So again, just to, to look over those words again, there are, as I said, literally hundreds of examples of this. And if you're just reading in the English, uh, the, the meaning itself might be lost um, because it, it does have a physical component to it. 
So these are all demonstrating the same behavior, just said in different ways. It's physical reverence and a, a display of submission to the Most High or to the authority. Because uh, I should say kings is what David also received the same, the same um, people in the same way. They would bow before the king and kneel before the earthly king. So, you know, people in authority over us, even if it's just a master and his servant, the master should be in subjection to the servant. We see that all throughout the scriptures, and that does involve a physical component. So I've just chosen a few of these verses, but the, the Nehemiah verse here really kind of has a bit of everything. So, and Ezra blessed Jehovah, the great Elohim, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped, or they bowed their heads and kneeled down to Jehovah with their faces to the ground. So that one verse kind of encapsulate, encapsulates the physical aspect of, of prayer. Okay, so we got through that. Um, and I guess we're going to now move on to when to pray. And I should say that anytime you want to, do it. It's an, an individual, spontaneous action. So anytime, day or night that you're called to speak, do it. Um, but in addition to that, there are prescribed times as a nation, as a body, that we are called to pray together. And those times, as I'm going to demonstrate, are not nine in the morning, noon, and three in the afternoon. So Yeshua says, not on the slide here, are there not 12 hours in the day? So if we take that, instead of our thinking of a 24-hour day, if we just convert the 12-hour day of when the sun is up. Um, that, it would be the noon, which is the largest meal. Yes. Um, just go back here. You just you just got froze right out there. I don't know if anyone else heard you, but I didn't hear a thing you said for about the last minute. I don't know. Can, am I uh, coming through a little better? You're better now. Yeah. Go back. Uh, just just about a minute. Uh, you're talking about uh, Psalm eighty-eight. No, uh, we got the the nine, twelve, and three p.m. But after that, I didn't you didn't come out. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, my internet is uh, not too great down here in the in the middle of nowhere. No, you're um, doing great. This is awesome. Just uh, I don't want to miss anything. That's why I said back up. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It's yours. Thank you. Um, so yeah, pr um, these times are significant, as we'll see. Um, 9 a.m. would be the time of the morning sacrifice. 3 p.m. the time of the evening sacrifice, and noon or 12 p.m. would be the time of right before the, the noontime meal, which was the largest meal of the day. So people would be gathered together at those specific times. And when there was a temple or a tabernacle even, the shofar would be blown at these times, indicating to everyone that now is the time to pray. And they would all do it as one body. But again, not necessarily praying about the same thing, but just praying at the same time. So... Um, as we can see the verses here, um, it says, Yehovah, in the morning shall, shall my prayer prevent thee. And Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And then from Acts 3.1, now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. So even given that specifically being the ninth hour. So now, again, only within the last month, probably even less, three weeks maybe, um, a few brothers and myself have taken to this prayer schedule three times a day as we say Daniel. So when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, um, he went into his house with his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, and he knelt upon his knees three times a day. So we don't have to physically be in Jerusalem to do this. Um, and even then that the temple wasn't, it was destroyed. So we don't even really need the temple um, to kneel upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his Elohim, as he did aforetime. Prayer, uh, Psalm 5517 sums it up very neatly in one verse. Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he, Jehovah, shall hear my voice. So, as I mentioned, I've been on this prayer schedule um, with a few brothers, and it, it really feels like two or three are gathered. Um, I can't really put that into words what that feeling is, 
but we've discussed it separately, you know, in the, in the interim time and we all kind of feel the same thing. So even though we're not physically together, I'm, I'm thousands of miles away from them. Um, just being together as a nation of, you know, handful of us brothers, it's yielded a tremendous benefit um, to myself and to them. So I would suggest setting an alarm, which is what I do, an alarm on my phone. I have three alarms set for those specific times. Um, because it just, with the cares of the day, and it just, it, you know, I'm like, oh, the alarm's ringing. It must be prayer time. But, you know, in a four time, they would have had the shofar blowing, so no one could have missed it. Um, so we do not have priests to blow the shofar in, the, in this time. So I kind of have a trumpet sounding alarm on my phone. So when the, I hear the, the trumpet blast, I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> time to pray. Um, now, in terms of time zones, that gets a little tricky. Jerusalem is seven hours ahead of the U.S. East Coast. So it would be getting close to 10 o'clock at night there. And it does, it's not really feasible being in the dispersion that we are to pray on Jerusalem time. So we've taken to praying on U.S. East Coast time. So for me, it's 10 o'clock East, 10 o'clock my time, 9 o'clock Eastern. But just, just in order to get the most people praying at the same time, that would be my suggestion. But if you're, say, in Europe or South Africa and it's closer to Jerusalem time, I would say do that is probably probably better, but I don't think he's going to hold that against us being where we are you know, in the dispersion. Um, so just a few more verses here. They rose up early in the morning. We don't get specific times as we did in Acts, but we can see the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, um, then Acts again, Cornelius again being a Gentile, but he would have heard again the shofar. So he would have known that the ninth hour or 3 p.m. was the hour of prayer. And understanding these appointed times, if we can call them appointed hours, um, we can see how prophetic they really are when we look at the crucifixion and the giving of the Holy Spirit at Shavuot. So the crucifixion began at the third hour, or 9 a.m. Mark 15, 33 to 34 says, when it was the sixth hour, so noontime, there came a darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., and at the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachathani, which is being interpreted, Elohim, Elohim, why hast thou forsaken me? And that's the time that he gave up the ghost at the time of the evening prayer. And then if we look at Acts, when the Holy Spirit is given, it says, for these are not drunken as you suppose, but seeing, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So at 9 a.m., that is when we were given um, or they, at least, were given the access to the Holy Spirit. And with these times in mind, it perhaps is time to reread this parable, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So Matthew 23 to 7. And he went out at about the third hour, this is the master, and saw the others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give unto you. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And at about the eleventh hour, which essentially means at the, at the last possible moment, so if you want to think Revelation times, <laughs> at about the eleventh hour, he went out again and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? And they said unto him, Because no man has hired us. And he said unto them at the eleventh hour, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So again, um, thank you for that. And there are, we see a lot morning and evening times mentioned, but not the specific hours as, um, so there are a lot more examples, but just those handful that actually lay it out as clearly as, as Acts or um, some of the Psalms do. So we're getting towards the end here, not much left. And thank you all for, for listening. I really do appreciate it. Um, so where do we pray? And that, is, seems pretty clear towards Jerusalem, towards the temple, towards the place where he has put his name. And again, we'll look at that same Daniel verse, and now we'll focus a few words earlier. So when Daniel, who was in Babylon, knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber, he looked towards Jerusalem, and he prayed, knelt down and prayed three times a day. Psalm 138.2, I will worship towards thy holy temple. I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness. And again, when David wrote these, 
the temple had not yet been built by Solomon. So he's worshiping towards the tabernacle or towards the ark, as it were. Um, and then Jonah 2.4, he said, he's in the belly of the beast at this point. And then he said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. And a couple more. I, I highly recommend, um, I didn't, just for time's sake, it's about a 60 verse prayer. It's first King. This is Solomon dedicating the temple. First Kings eight. Um, I, I can't recommend strongly enough reading this with everything that I've mentioned in mind, um, because it, it really drives home the fact. Um, we can see just in these uh, five verses, how many times he's going to say the same thing. So we're starting at verse 28. It says, hearken unto the cry and to the prayer, which thy servant prayeth before thee today that thine eyes may be opened towards this house night and day, even towards the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make towards this place, and hearken unto the supplication of thy servant and thy people Israel, when they shall pray, pray towards this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. Verse 35, for when heaven is shut up, there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray towards this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou hast afflicted them, then hear and then thou hear in heaven. And it goes on and on. And you know, he they, he then is he's prophesying as well about being dispersed when when you know the curses come upon the people and they're no longer here. But if they still turn and look towards this place and do all of the things, you know. That we've, that we've previously discussed, having the right heart and the right mind and the right physical attributes, then thou shalt hear in heaven. So for myself, um, sorry, so for myself being here in South America, you know, I'm looking towards the east. I know we have some brothers and sisters in the Pacific Rim, you know, in Asia, they would be looking towards the west. South Africa would be looking towards the north. So wherever you are, it might be a different direction that you're facing. So if you want to be precise about it, um, I kind of just face northeast, making sure I'm not looking at the sun <laughs> during sunrise, but I kind of offset a little bit from it, just, just in case I don't, want to, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm, I'm praying to the sun. Um, but there are, are apps. Um, you can do a quick search, Jerusalem Compass. Um, if you just search that name or find Jerusalem, you know, there's dozens of apps which you can install and you just turn with your phone and it's just a compass which will direct you towards Jerusalem. Um, so if that's if something um, that you may find usable, but I just, I look towards the Northeast and I think that's, um, you know, in the general direction of where Jerusalem is for me. And so finally, the last one, what to pray. And I don't want to get too into the weeds here because everyone is going to be praying for different things depending on your own personal circumstances. But I do see a, a model based on scriptural prayer, other people praying in the scripture that we can look upon. So we're never given instructions that I've been able to find on this, but just based on the way other people pray, I'm just going to show you two of them here. But if you go back to that first Kings, uh, the Solomon prayer, again, it's long, but it essentially follows the same model, just repeating over and over again within those 60 or so verses. So <clears throat> just a little mnemonic. Um, P, I do for praise, R for reflect on ourselves, our shortcomings, as well as reflect on his power and his grace onto us. Um, then ask your petition and yield to his will whether he is prepared to grant your petition. So if we just look at the uh, uh, Jehovah's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, it says, uh, uh, Yeshua starts with praising. He says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then he reflects, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now he's going to ask his petition. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And finally, he's going to yield his will unto the Father. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The next, um, and this is my last grouping of slides, is this prayer from Daniel 9. Um, which we mentioned earlier, at the end of this prayer is when the angel is sent, who says, you know, I came at the beginning of your petition. So we, we, get the, we, we see in the heaven that 
once a prayer has even begun before it's left our mouths, they've already heard it and have acted upon it. I just wanted to reinforce that because to me, that's just blows my mind every time I think about it. Um, so we'll see the same thing here. Uh, verse three and four, Daniel begins with some praise. Says, Set my face unto Jehovah God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So again, it doesn't necessarily say that he's kneeling or bowing or raising his hands, but you can just tell he's, he's afflicting himself. He's getting down low. He's becoming dirty, you know, in ashes and sackcloth. So he's, he's making himself lower and subjecting himself while he's doing this. <clears throat> and I prayed unto Jehovah, my God, and I made my confession and said, O Jehovah, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now he's going to reflect on um, his shortcomings, the shortcomings of the nation and the, the, the might and the greatness of Jehovah. It says, for we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from my precepts and from my judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in the name of our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Jehovah, Righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. Unto the men of Judah and unto the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off throughout all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Jehovah, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to the fathers because we have sinned against thee. To Jehovah our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of Jehovah our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven has not been done as has been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet make we not our prayer before Jehovah our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore, hath Jehovah watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For Jehovah our God is righteous in all his works that he doeth, for we obeyeth not his voice. And now, O Jehovah our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renown, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. So that is a lot of reflection, and I, um, we can all... I'm pretty sure say that that applies to us today as well as it did to Daniel back then and to the people in the wilderness as well. Um, so now, after saying all of that, after the praise and the reflection, he's going to ask his petition. It says, O Jehovah, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of the fathers. Jerusalem and all the people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy faith to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for your sake. And now he's going to yield. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Jehovah, hear. O Yehovah, forgive. O Yehovah, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people that are called by thy name. And so that's, that's pretty much my presentation. Um, again, I want to thank you all for, for hanging in there. Um, and yeah, so again, search the scriptures. Don't take my word for it. Um, I'm going to, once I stop sharing here, I'm going to put that... Uh, link into the chat so take your time it's six articles it's it's a it's a heavy read but again he lays out hundreds of articles as well hundreds of verses as well 
Um, so if this has led you, um, please feel free to search those out. And when you're reading the scripture, again, just keep in mind the Hebrew mindset of praise and worship and being humble and, and words like that. Um, they do take a physical component. So um, again, yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Lewis. That was awesome. I have a cramp in my hand from <laughs> writing notes. Uh, when I when I preview this stuff, I just want to make sure that you're on the right track. I'm not looking at everything you say. So when uh, when we do get here, um, I've, I've got something to um, to listen to. So I appreciate this. I, don't go away though, because I want you to answer people's questions. You've you've convicted me. Um, since I read your notes, I've been trying to pray, uh, you know, differently. I pray. I try and pray at nine, noon, and three, but like you said, life happens and uh, I get close. Um, but raising my hands, I was raised in a, a church where you fold your hands in front of you and you, you bowed your head. And so raising my hands has always been strange to me. And, and then when I got in the, the Hebrew Roots movement, I seen people going prostrate on the floor and I thought, that's weird. Um, it's a big adjustment I've had to do. Uh, but I, I can't tell how much I appreciate you coming on here today and, and sharing this with us. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't put it in the presentation, um, but I, I thought about that same thing that you just mentioned. Um, oftentimes, um, that one image I had of the person kneeling before the king, people would associate that posture perhaps with Islam and even with raising the hands, sometimes that's associated with the, the Pentecostal movement or some of the more, yeah. you know, I want to be careful what I say, but you know, some of the more, um, you know what I mean? So, um, but they do appear to be scriptural. And I did a, I did a quick look um, for the traditional, if we can call it that, approach of folding your hands in front of you. And I haven't been able to find any scriptures backing that up. That's not to say they're not there. Um, I just haven't been able to find them myself. Um, so again, just you know, take it to the take it to the word and and, and see what you all what you all think. Nancy, you got your hand and up. And just finally, I'm just putting. I just put the uh, the link in the chat there. So if anyone was does want to copy that, um, and bookmark that for later, it's there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, but. I have, I have one question, um, and I've always, in my mind, kind of struggled with it. Um, and funny enough, this was one of the very first things that really made me question um, my place in, in our church. And we were, we, my husband and I used to teach children's ministry, and I just remember our, uh, our praise leader was up there defining what worship was. And it just didn't sit well with me. And I remember going home and doing the research and I'm like, this isn't, this isn't what it means. And her, her definition was that the derivative came from worth and that we were to give God worth. And I thought, Oh my gosh, like who are we to give him worth or value or any of that? And when I actually looked up the Strong's definition, as you had shown on one of your slides, it was a physical act more than, the definition of like defining what, what to say or what to do. And it was more physical. And ever since then, um, we've changed the, how physically, how we pray. But the one, one big question I had was, um, I, I don't know. It's like the chicken and the egg. I don't know what came first. Like I have a strong feeling and belief that Yahovah from the beginning of time with Adam and Eve gave them mitzvahs and told them, what times to do things. And I even look back at uh, Cain and Abel and look at that as like an uh, 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 offering, first fruits offering, um, because Cain came in, in, it, in his own time. I can't remember how, how it's phrased. I just paraphrased that. But, um, and I just have a feeling when they talk about people being righteous throughout the Bible uh, before Moses, um, that they knew, knew these things. So my big question is this, you talk about the times and I always wonder what came first, like the times came first and then God kind of filled in the prophetic things that happened behind it to occur at that time. 
or vice versa. But being that we know that Jerusalem is God's city and that's, kind, that's where everything happened, have you ever questioned or wondered, and this is for Lewis, but also for everyone else to chime in, like when you look at those times, did you ever once think, okay, well, I should be praying Jerusalem time? Not my time where I am now, because those things happened at those times in Jerusalem. Yeah, I guess I'll take that first. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I have thought about that. Um, it just, to me, I, I think that we probably should, I guess is the short answer, because I would say that that is the land that we're, we're hoping to get back to. Um, that's the land we were promised, and we should be looking there and doing things with that in mind. Just in terms of practicality, where we are, um, at least I can speak for myself, where I am, you know, it's about seven hours, six hours ahead of me, so I would need to wake up at three o'clock every morning in the middle of the night in order to get the nine o'clock prayer. And it just, it's not a practical solution for myself to be able to do that. So I'm, I'm counting on his grace to realize that, you know, this is where he's placed me and he understands that I'm, I'm trying my best. Um, and even, even just again, to mention where I am, I'm not doing it and perhaps I'm wrong in, in, in what I'm doing, but I'm doing it at 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 4 p.m. in order to get in line with the other brothers that, you know, I've decided with. We've all, you know, one, one is on the west coast of the U.S., and he's still doing it at, at Eastern time, just so that we're all doing it at the same time. Um, and again, maybe that, that might not be the right thing to do. That's kind of just what we decided upon. Um, so, yeah, that would be my answer to that. The short answer, I guess, is yes. I, I would say we should be doing it at Jerusalem time, but for myself, at least, it's not really practical to do that. I have a, my husband and I kind of were talking. Go ahead, Nancy. Go ahead. No, nope. I was, I was just, just saying we debated about it. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead, Nancy. If you wanted to make a comment, go ahead. We're talking over top of each other. I apologize. I'm just curious on everyone's thoughts because I don't know why I just strongly feel like it should, should be like, if we think about it, then being prophetic and even now being prophetic and future events happening and, you know, Yahovah knows all that those were the times and that's the place and that's the time is in Jerusalem. I just have this strong feeling like, okay, well, it's not like a Sabbath where it's, you know, Right now, obviously, it's not the same time in Jerusalem, but we're still celebrating, s keeping Sabbath. But I feel like because it's more prophetic that we should keep those times because things happened, as Lewis pointed out, at those times all throughout history, and I believe will continue to happen at those times in future history or in future, you know, things to unfold. The, the, if, if we go down that road, and we try and do it, like uh, Lewis said, at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. or whatever time zone you're in, to do it at 9 a.m. Jerusalem time, then the next thing will be, well, we have to start Sabbath when they start keeping Sabbath there, um, their time. So for me on the Eastern uh, time zone, that would be six hours before sunset here. So I would have to start keeping the Sabbath at about 12 noon, Friday afternoon, to be on the same timeline with them over there therefore my sabbath isn't at sunset anymore it now begins at high noon or somebody in california who's three hours behind me uh to be at 9 a.m they start their sabbath on a friday and it just becomes impractical to think of it that way so i understand what lewis was trying to do being in sync with everyone in jerusalem at the same time and if it's a special um a special event that the high priest is doing at that time, yeah, I would I would get up at early to listen to him at that same time. But we are scattered around the world. And go ahead, Michelle. No, I just my thoughts is, isn't this for us 
everything that we are doing now, isn't it basically a, a rehearsal so that when we do find ourselves in Jerusalem with our Yehovah, that we will eventually be on the correct time. I'll let you take that one, Lewis. And then after that, I'm going to go to a comment and then we're going to start answering the different hands here. So Lewis, you want to respond to Michelle? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't have Levites. We don't have priests guiding us. We just kind of have the words that are left behind and, and the spirit to guide us. So I, I would agree completely. We don't have physical leaders in the flesh to show us these things and to teach us and to even to blow the show far so that if we're, you know, a few miles outside of town, you know, we'll hear it and, and come to it. Um, so yeah, it, it all is a rehearsal. And I think, especially, again, going back to the time question, again, we're showing our heart and our desire to do it, even if we're not doing it 100% correctly or exactly as it's prescribed. Um, we're showing our desire to, to, to follow the word as closely as we can, given our, our physical location and, and our limitations. Okay, I got a comment here from Lindsay um, Dredger. This was so, and I don't know if you've been able to read the comment. I can't read them when I'm talking. So I, I wanted to, you've got a lot of positive uh, responses here, Lewis. So that you've done awesome, real good. Uh, this was so informative. I had no idea about the connection between the hand, which I thought was amazing, your connection here. That's me saying that. Uh, Lindsay saying, in the Hebrew and praise, this answered my prayer from last night when I asked Jehovah why some people put out, put one hand up when they worship. And I don't understand that myself. So I'm, another prayer that was uh, answered during the, your teaching is I have asked Jehovah many times what it means to humble myself before him, as this is what I want to do, and to treat my king with more reverence. And, you know, she's speaking here. She's saying a lot of things I'm thinking, and I think a lot of us. Uh, before, as this is what I want to do, and to treat my king with more reverence, the reverence he deserves and would like from me. So I would like to start praying the three daily times and prostrate. Uh, thank you so much for this teaching. You have given me a good place to start. And she's speaking for a lot of us. So thank you, Lewis. Well, thank you all so much. That, that, that really warms me. Um, I, I, I did not read the chat as it was going. I just couldn't no, get between screens. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah, and that, that progression, from Yad to Yada to Yahuda. I actually found that this morning. So even at the at the eleventh hour, as it were, um, you know, the Almighty was giving me some, a little bit of revelation. So yeah, I think that that's really fantastic. So um, I'm glad that that reached um, reached some of you. Yeah. It, so tell answer. Can you address the thing about praying with one hand up, like like some people do? Is, is do you have any comments on that? Or like, do we have, are we supposed to go like this with two hands up or can you go with one? You know? Um, personally, I do too. Um, that's just, I guess that's my own preference. Um, I've seen when people do one hand up, it just, I don't know if they're subconsciously doing it. I would assume the other hand seems to go to their heart. Um, and I, I am all for that. <laughs> I think that's a great posture. And uh, the two of the verses that I gave before, I don't know if it's just, the, I don't know if I, I, I'm not any, in any way a Hebrew scholar. So I don't know if the word hand could be plural to mean hands, plural, or just one. Um, but Yehovah said, I lift up my hand to heaven. So singular. And then Aaron lifted up his hand to bless the people. So again, it's singular in the text. Um, I didn't put it in the presentation, but in Daniel 12, the, the angel lifts up one hand, or maybe the revelation, I'm not sure, lifts up one hand to heaven and begins. And then as he's speaking, the other hand goes up as well. So I, from what I see, both are acceptable. Um, I, it, it, more verses are plural than singular. If we're just going to look at it in terms of numbers, but I think both are, both are fine. And again, if, if you're in the kneeling down with your face to the ground position it's for me at least sometimes it's uncomfortable to bring my arms forward in that position 
so it, it could be a one or the other kind of thing. I don't have I don't think you have to check every single box every single time. It's more just of being in submission and and just bowing your head and realizing that, you know, you're you're being heard in the throne room and the beasts are there and the angels are there and the elders are there, um, hearing your words as you're speaking them and just having the reverence um, to show. Okay, we got a question from Denise, uh, Denise W. in Michigan. Go ahead. Are you there? Yes, hi. Um, from what I see, there's no real scriptural mandate for everyone to be running their lives on Jerusalem time. If you stop and think about it, I just looked it up. There are between 24 and 37 time zones all around the world. If people were praying at three and noon and nine, that would be just a constant flow of praise, supplication, and thankfulness before the throne, 24-7. Mm -hmm. So I would think that would be much more reasonable for everybody. And that would just flood the, flood the throne room all the time instead of at, just at Jerusalem time. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, where, hang on, you just disappeared on me. Paul Collier, everyone keeps moving here. I'm mute, lower your hand. Paul Collier, you got the floor. Thank you, Joe. Um, the thing that uh, amazed me was that Abraham did it just before um, Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and he honored the Lord by bowing low to the ground. Um, and he was respected by Jehovah, considered righteous. So our actions, um, when we want and know Jehovah, is to do what has been done by others. Even Yeshua bowed low to the ground to honor his father that had his will in mind, not his own. So I think it's having the will of the desire to know the will of the Father uh, more than anything else in our actions that bring us to that point of submitting to Jehovah in the way that um, we can only do that position. But the question comes soon, we'll be doing it to somebody else and we don't want to. We've got to be strong and courageous in the in this area that only Jehovah is the one to to bow down and worship. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Teacher Zach, you have the mic. Yes, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, that was a really great teaching. You did a lot of research on that. So praise Yah, man. Um, I, I just had to share a comment, and then I have two questions for you, Lewis. My first comment is that, um, like, I remember I started to research in that about, like, worship being, in the Hebrew, it means act or uh, motion. And so uh, it's also related to the Hebrew word for work. As if you are not standing still, there's some sort of uh, action that has to be taken. So. Um, I, uh, I uh, Zach, too Zach, about that. Zach, I'm sorry, you just you caught my ear, but I only caught half. Can you back up and just repeat what you just said? Because I wasn't really paying attention. Do that again, please. About okay. about standing still and work. Just I just want to hear what you said again. Okay, sure, sure. If I cut out, just let me know. I think it was me anyway, not paying attention. I'm reading the reading the stuff here on the side, but you said something. I said, what? What? Okay. I want to hear that. Sorry. <laughs> no, I I think I uh, I was watching a teaching about the the Hebrew words of work. Uh, I think it's obed, uh, and it's related to worship or obey, and in their root meaning, they relate to do having some form of action. And it's not just uh, it's not just standing still, or it's not just uh, empty. Uh, promises. It's some kind of action. Basically, you do you are putting your faith into action. Um, so, 
I, I, that stuck out to me with this teaching today about prostrating yourself before the before Abba, and I I really think that it's a great confirmation that um, we he brought Lewis brought this teaching out today. The thing I I was trying to also mention is that uh, some like I was do I was starting to prostrate myself before and. Uh, a, a well-known a person who knows me well uh, said to me, "Oh, you're doing just like the Muslims. You're you're trying to be Muslim." <laughs> so, and so that kind of like shocked me because I I I it kind of like uh, pushed me away. You know, like I I I kind of felt bad, but I think I realized that no, what happened is in Islam, he you know Muhammad copied a lot of stuff from the Torah. And so that is uh, some things that were also a part of Torah and from the scriptures he copied into Islam, uh, such as uh, hand washings. In Islam, they do a lot of hand washing and things like that. The Levitical priests were already implementing that before Islam. So we may see some things in Islam that resemble um, what, what the scriptures say, but actually the scriptures have demonstrated it first for us, if there is any resemblance or likeness. And so I just wanted to share that with a lot of brethren to not be discouraged if something looks similar to Islam. Uh, you have to remember that the enemy will try to use it and, and twist it. And, and some people are just confused, but a lot of original things come from the Bible, the scriptures. So um, that's my comment. And then the two questions I have for Lewis is, what would you recommend for, for people who are disabled and they aren't able to uh, prostrate or something like that? And, and uh, anyone else who can chime in on it, if, you, if you're not sure, it's okay. And um, also the second question is the timing. There's such amazing accuracy with the times related to the sacrifices, morning, noon, and evening, 9 a.m., noon, and 3. So I just wondered, what, what, what did you see deeper in that? Why those times? They really are amazing. So uh, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Brother Joe. Hi, thank you, Zach. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can just be something as simple as, as closing your eyes and bowing your head. Um, I didn't mention the eyes. Um, it, I, I didn't really notice anything about eyes open or closed. Personally, my eyes close of themselves when I'm praying. Um, but I didn't, I didn't notice anything one way or the other doing the research. Um, but just lowering your head or just putting your gaze to the ground, um, if you're not able to, to kneel, you know, arthritis or what have you. Um, you know, I just, it just any act, really, just to show, you know, what you're trying to do, um, even if it's just just kind of lowering your head just a little bit or just putting your gaze. Um, we get that one story um, in the Gospels, you know, where the righteous Pharisee is looking up to heaven and the sinner comes and beats his chest with, the eyes to, with his eyes to the ground. Um, so it didn't say he was kneeling or had his arms up. He just had his eyes to the ground and he was justified in doing it. True. Um, really yeah, and like regarding the times, um, just as I'm doing it now, it gives you... It gives me anyway a little bit of time. You know, my son comes up about seven-ish this the, these days, so I get a couple hours before time to you know take care of whatever business I need to do, and then it's prayer, and then you know between nine and noon, you know do whatever work I'm doing for the day or, or what have you, and then it's prayer, <laughs> and then do a little bit more, and then it's prayer again, and then after the evening prayer, which again is three o'clock, so there's still you know, time left of, of the sun, you get to kind of complete your day and get things in order for the next and then wake up and start again. So just practically, it seems like a great time to do it because you get, you know, three hours roughly before the first prayer and three hours roughly after the last prayer. And then they're broken down in three hour intervals. So it just seems like the right way, you know, it's, it's from him. So it's obviously correct. Um, you know, the right way to do it just on a, on a routine type, type basis. Yes. Awesome. Hey, Lewis, can I... But again, I would say strongly recommend... Go ahead. Go ahead, Lewis. Sorry for cutting sorry, you off. Sorry, just that... Just, no, 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 of course. Uh, I would just strongly recommend setting some kind of reminder 
Um, if it's on a phone or if you have a wind up clock or whatever you have, um, set a reminder because the cares of the day, even I, I still have it in my mind that I want to do it and that I'm going to do it. And the alarm just beeps out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's that time already. So it, it's very easy to let it go by um, if you don't have some kind of you know, audible or, or visual reminder to do it. So that would be my suggestion. I was going to ask you um, any recommendation on how long, because uh, I, I hear things from the Christian community about we're supposed to pray for a certain set amount of time. You got any comments on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing scripturally that I found. Because if you look at that, the Daniel prayer, that was pretty long. I, I would say that most of us probably don't pray for that amount of time. At least I don't. I actually probably just speak for myself. Um, and then if you look at some of the Psalms, they may be just one or two verses. They maybe just get 10, 15 seconds of prayer. Um, so I guess it depends on what, what you're asking and why you're, why you're praying in the first place. I find, that, I find that my noontime prayer is usually my longest one. It just seems to be that way. It's not planned or anything, just kind of things pop into my head as it goes, and then I end up asking them at that noon, just kind of seems to be the way it is, but I don't think there's any, I guess we're, we're um, warned not to speak just to speak, you know, thinking by the more words we say, the, the likely we are to be heard, kind of butchered that verse, but hopefully you'll know which, which one I mean. Yeah. So I would just say, I mean, he, he's a busy God, he's got every, every run and everything to look after, so <laughs> we don't really want to waste his time i suppose just kind of say what you need to say praise him and get, get on with it i guess would be my advice okay we got a hand up from Susie at jean as john hey it's hugo, uh, hugo. Uh, just my okay. wife and my son yeah they use my computer so uh, thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you, Joe, for what you do. Uh, I have uh, two things I would like to bring uh, on the subject. If we look at the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Zadi, uh, which has a, an idea of uh, righteousness. Well, the letter Zadi, its form, it's like a man kneeling down, praying with his hands up. And, and the letter Zadi Sofit, because there's a letter Zadi Sofit also. And this letter looks like a man standing up with his hands raised. It, just two things about the letter Zadi, just that. Hugo, have you, do, you happen to, do you happen to have the, the pictures of those letters that you could put on here and share, this, share on the screen with us? Do you have them on your computer? You can pull up. Uh, okay. That's the letter Zadi, and that's the letter Zadi Sophie. They look like that both. And one is look like a man uh, kneeling, his hand raised, and the other one is like a man standing, his hand raised. It, it's just a, a, a picture of the letter Zadi. And my other point is, uh, there are uh, 34 or 30 uh, time zones. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm from the Catholic Church. And the language the Catholic Church uses Latin language. And if we look in Hebrew, the definition of Latin, it means magic, enchantment. And, and if we know that there are 30 something time zones, this magic prayer because they pray these priests they talk to their congregation their congregation uh, uh say hey man and then they kneel down and pray in latin and that's the meaning of the word latin enchantment and magic and that's what goes on 24 7 all around the clock Hey, these are my two points I wanted to bring uh, in the regard to praying. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Joe. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, Paul Collier, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, 
Just a, a little story that was given to me a long time ago. A farmer doesn't always have time when he's working his farm. So in the morning, he will say, thank you, thank you to Jehovah for the day. And then he will go out and do his work for the day and come in at night and say, thank you, you have looked after me today, Jehovah. I bless you. And in some respects, the time that he had, he gave to his father to honour him for the whole day. And then at night, he did the same in return to come back and say thank you. Uh, and that is similar to what maybe whatever work we do. If we say thank you to father for giving me a job for the day, uh, even though during the day I sometimes think about what Jehovah is teaching me, I still then say at the end of the day, thank you, Jehovah, for the day that you have looked after me a day, at least brought me home safely, because a lot of people are not coming home safely at all at the moment. Thank you. Joe, Joseph? Hang on, David. When Jesus, when are you, are you, when Jesus was at the, I was going to make a comment. Go ahead, then. When, Joseph, when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, he said he looked up and thank God for hearing him. So he had his eyes open when he prayed. Okay. Okay, Sal, you got so your you hand can up. Can look, you can pray. Do you watch, sir? No, I thought you yes, were done, you. David. Go ahead, I Sal. Wanted... Okay, there is also a Hebrew letter that in the pictographs is, let's see, can you see that? Yep. Okay, so it is, it's the, that's the pictographs, the ancient Hebrew for the letter hey, and it is obviously somebody praising. And, and uh, it's, so when we say yod hey, vav hey, it is, Praise is twice in there. Yod <laughs> is his picture of he is working on our behalf yeah. and we're to praise him. The Vav is uh, he sent his son to anchor his word here on earth. And then we have the other hey, which is to praise him for his both the law and his son. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Are you, are you done? Yes. Okay, um, I'm done. Hank, you got your hand up. I just wanted to say thank you, Lewis, and then thank you to the gentleman. I don't want to try to pronounce your name because I'll just mispronounce it like crazy, but that just makes a whole lot of sense that if the Catholic Church is praying 24-7, that's even more of a reason for us to be praying no matter what time zone it is so that we can match and go beyond that, uh, the prayer three times a day. Mm -hmm. Amen. Where are you from, Hank, before you go? Uh, Seattle, Washington. Okay, thank you for joining us. Okay, we got no more hands up. Oh, well, Kurt, you got, go ahead. Uh, I didn't catch his name, but he mentioned Latin. How That's would Hugo. you spell Hugo. that? In okay, Hugo. Um, that's interesting what you said. How would you spell Latin in Hebrew? What letters would that be? Lama. Oh, right. The root of the word Latin is Lamed. And, and if you add vowel-like letters like Lamed Aleph Tet or Lamed He Tet or Lamed Vav Tet, Lamed Yod Tet, even Lamed Ain Tet, you will find these uh, um, awful definition of the word Latin. And, and it, it, it regards to whispering, speaking softly. And that's what the priests do when they kneel down and, and pray in Latin. Uh, it, it has an idea of, of enclosing and wrapping. And that's what they've been doing in their, uh, uh, you know, where they uh, secret or, or took the, 
Native American and then to teach them, you know, these college. I've been to one of them. Uh, private school, that's what it is. You know, enclosed people. And there's also this uh, definition of, of this word that is to swallow greedily. And, and, and if the beast of revelation is not that beast that is swallowing greedily everyone, well, the word Latin says all that. Again, it's the letter lamed, tet, and, and you put a, a vowel-like letter like aleph, he, va, yod, even ayin. And all these definitions are there. Interesting. You've given me something to look up in my Hebrew dictionary. Thank you. Hey, uh, which Hebrew dictionary you, you're using? Uh, Ernest <laughs> Klein. Yes, <laughs> that's it. I'm getting beat up. That's a good sign. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Put tape on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a very good binding to start with, them, but yeah, I'll, same I'll make me. it survive. Same for yeah. me. Simon, you had your hand up a little while ago. Gone or not? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Anyone got a, anyone else have another question for Lewis or about prayer? Lewis, would you honor us and, and close out this teaching with a prayer then, please? Hi, uh, sure, Lucy, thank you. Hey, praise you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you all for for listening and your questions and and your comments. I, I scrolled up through the chat, so um, thank you all for that. This this really really makes me feel good. So th thank you very much. Um, so, <clears throat> Father Yehovah, mighty and true, glorious and powerful, um, I would like to thank you for letting us all gather together today. Thank you for um, aside from one internet um, attack making that uh, much smoother than it usually is so thank you so much um, i know that i have not yet attained to your standards that uh, my flesh is weak um, but i'm doing the best that i can and with your spirit um, showing me new revelations every day so please continue to strengthen me as well as everyone else brothers and sisters on the call um, empty our cups and Put in, fill us up with your will and your spirit so that we can do things uh, as, as you see righteous and that will please you. So all things according to your will, Father. Um, please do not forget your servants, but look down upon us with grace. Thank you. Amen. 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 Let it be. Yeah.